entertain them, they'll sit and watch. Make it an event, they'll come back. Build them a memory, they'll call it home. Philadelphia was a tempestuous city at that time. The mayor was Jim Tate. He ran against a young district attorney named Arlen Specter, who he narrowly beat by 9,000 votes. Arlen Specter, of course, we know what happened to him in the years uh, subsequent to that. The acting police commissioner was a guy named Frank Rizzo, and he was very controversial, but very loved by people because of his law, law and order stance. And he had two prerequisites for his leadership, keep the city clean and keep the city very safe. I was a uh, reporter and uh, city editor for the Philadelphia Daily News at that time. And I had been covering uh, City Hall for uh, a few years, and that's where I met Ed Snyder. And one day he said to me, we're trying to get a franchise in the National Hockey League, which is expanding from 16th to 12th for the first time in its 50-year history. And if we get a franchise, we have to build a new arena. Would you be interested? We had a $2 million franchise price. and. We came up with X amount of dollars, but we had to find a bank to lend us on that, against that franchise a certain amount of money. So we went to all of the banks in the city, and uh, one banker said, you know, I don't think soccer will ever go over. I said, yes. <laughs> I resigned from the newspaper, much to the chagrin of my wife and uh, family and friends who thought I was crazy because, A, they didn't think the arena would ever get built. Another banker sort of dozed off while we were talking to him. And B, they didn't th think hockey would ever go over in Philadelphia. So we were really in trouble. It was the last bank that we could go to, and luckily, uh, the president and vice president, Bill Baer, who was a friend of mine forever, um, you know, they played hockey at Harvard. So we, uh, we lucked out. It was big for me because I was a big hockey fan because uh, I had worked as a stick boy for the old Philadelphia Ramblers at the arena, uh, 46 and Market Streets. I had taken a, uh, a trip up to New York with Mr. Snyder and Joe Scott, and the old owner of the Ramblers was with us, and he said, you're not going to have any more than 3,000 people at your hockey games. We broke ground uh, on a hot July afternoon. Windy, sticky, and dirty. I remember it down on the dump. <laughs> We put the shovel in the ground, and I was determined to come up with a new name. And I walked through the building with a PR guy uh, who was working on the account from an advertising agency, and we started throwing out different names. And the word Spectrum came up. And I said, I'm not sure what that means, but if it's anything close, that is it. And I went back to my office and opened the dictionary, and I looked up the word Spectrum, and it said, images which form displays, colors emanating from the prism, anything colorful under the sun. I said, that's it, that's what we, we do. We're gonna present everything colorful under the sun. When it was first built, and when you first walked into it, I mean, it was, it felt like you were walking into a palace. I mean, that was how it looked and felt to us as a city, because, I mean, you have to remember what we were comparing it to. Saturday uh, morning in February, uh, maybe four months after we opened, we had an ice capade show. Midway through the show, this fierce wind kicked up and this howling wind around the building. And all of a sudden, if you looked up, you could see light. You had to be there to understand it was really a cave-in. It wasn't just a small hole. And, when, <laughs> and, every, and all the writers in this town, you know, writers in this town can be blasphemous. And uh, in those days, they just knocked the whole city and the inspection establishment and Snyder and this and that. And you know what happened? The roof never came off. That, everybody thinks the roof blew off, the roof collapsed. It didn't. The tar paper and the insulation came off and blew away. So they, you know what? They fixed it. 
and, and the rest is history. What they did was they came and they put in 8 billion bolts. <laughs> I don't know how many bolts. Two inches apart through the entire roof. I know if we implode this building at the end of this year, that roof is not going to move. The building will blow, but the roof will stay up. All of those things, it was a very difficult time, uh, but we got through it. What was really remarkable is that once they got it fixed and we came back and started to play, uh, our fan base was still there. It became America's showplace, and uh, whereas we were overshadowed in some people's minds by Madison Square Garden in New York and the LA Forum, we actually had more events, we actually made more money. We were a more successful enterprise. Every night was a happening. Every, every, there was a full house and people to see and fans, and they became your friends, uh, companions, and they still are a lot of them today. I couldn't wait to get here. It, it was the, the crowd appeal, the intimacy of being right on top of every play. It, it was great. I mean, it was just the best of times. I mean, you had the National Hockey League, all the big teams, all the big players are coming to Philadelphia, and they're playing in this sparkling, new, beautiful building. And for two bucks, you can be part of it. I mean, what could be better? Well, if I had you know, one wish that could be granted to me in my lifetime, it would be to play one more meaningful game in the spectrum, but if it couldn't be a game, even if I could just play one more meaningful shift in my life, it would be so special, but I know it's not going to happen. It was us and 17,000 people against the opposite team. How could you lose? You felt so comfortable there and you wanted to be there. It wasn't like working. It was like just being at home. It's part of the Philadelphia folklore. The people in that building absolutely loved the players and they loved the Flyers. Where I grew up and where I played, the building sat a thousand people, maybe less than that. And, uh, for me to go into a building like that, it just seemed huge and, and intimidating. Walking out to, to what was going to be center ice at that point, looking around, uh, it, it'd give you chills. My goodness, I mean, it, it just seemed like a castle. It seemed big and it seemed beautiful. It was walking into the unknown and then not sure what's going to happen. The response of the people in Philadelphia, whether they're going to love us, support us, or not. Those early days were scary. I mean, because, I mean, you looked around, I mean, that building was empty. And there was the thought that, oh my goodness, you know, we finally got an NHL team in Philadelphia, and what if it doesn't make it? It was a very difficult time, uh, but we got through it, and we got through it with flying colors. And to see this, woo, we got a lot of work in front of us, but it just, it took off, bing, 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 bing. When we first came in and, and the crowds were sparse and it was easy to get a ticket, uh, they still enjoyed the game. I'm not sure they knew at first what they were enjoying. There was a sort of a hesitancy, you know, is it okay to cheer now? Is, is that a good play? I'm not sure. <laughs> I mean, a lot of people were coming to the game just because it was a night out and they were kind of learning as they went. People didn't even understand what hockey was, many of them in this area. When you think about how this franchise took off, yes, it had to do with Bob Clark, yes, it had to do with Bernie Perrant, yes, it had to do with Dave Schultz and the players, but if there was anyone who wasn't a player that was just as important, along with Ed Snyder, it was Gene Hart. Ladies and gentlemen, the Flyers are going to win the Stanley Cup! The Flyers win the Stanley Cup! The Flyers the Cup! He taught everybody in the Delaware Valley about hockey and about the passion of the sport. The personality of the team became the personality of the fans and then also became the whole personality of the building. And it was one intimidating place to step into in those years. The record speaks to that. People talk about home field advantage, home ice advantage in all kinds of sports. And some it's more than others. And this one to me was one of the most prominent what more can be said when you step on the ice, uh, you felt 
no pain you felt, even though you might be beat up a little bit, but overall, you felt like a million dollars. It was our house, and we wanted teams to come into our building, hating to come in. It was more than a home. It was uh, something that we shared with 17,000 people every night, and the, the people of Philadelphia made it, uh, made it feel like it was a place of invincibility. Well, it was pretty uh, intimidating, to be honest with you. I was 18, and uh, I was probably 160 pounds. I looked out on the ice in the morning skate, saw guys like Bob Kelly and Dave Schultz and Bobby Clark and <laughs> everybody that I kind of grew up watching thinking, wow, these guys are crazy. So my, my only thought the entire day was that I was going to be the fastest player I'd ever been in my life. If they're going to hit me, they're going to have to catch me. <laughs> the thing of it is they knew that they were coming in here and the fans would just get us pumped up to no end and they thought, oh man, we're going to have to deal with these guys for 60 minutes. I mean, they used to talk about the Philadelphia flu, all the kinds of things that we used to develop the day we had to go take a test in school. Well, that used to afflict NHL players when they came to Philadelphia because all of a sudden a lot of good players didn't feel like playing that night. It was almost as if the building itself had an aura, and when people got close to it that had to compete in that building against the Flyers, then the tremor started whenever you even heard the name, the Spectrum. The noise levels were incredible. I think it was the vertical nature of it. Everybody was so close to the action. Short-handed breakaway by Dave Cullen. He's going right on in. Shoot, go! You know, 17,000, 007. That was, that was the magic number that we sold out. But we, they got so loud, and it just stayed in. The Oilers to the point. Daniels at the goal! Crazy. The noise was was piercing at times. Let me tell you, sometimes it felt like the fans were right on top of you, and there's no question about that. Howard there, shoots, good! All right, he did it again! I don't believe it! Bedlam at the Spectrum! It was almost like if you were a rock star, you'd have to have those plugs in your ears to handle the noise. You couldn't hear, and, and literally you couldn't talk to to your line mates on the ice hardly does. It was so loud, it was wonderful. This is incredible. The Soviet Army team is going back to the, the locker room. They are leaving, they are walking out. Everyone in Philadelphia as a fan wanted to be with the winner, wanted to see a winner. And these guys were not only winners, they were kicking butts while they were doing it. You made a country leave the building. You made sort of a, a whole political system leave the building. So if a political system couldn't exist in this building, how could a visiting team? My One of the things I remember about every show here is just the enthusiasm of the crowd. And to clowns, which is what the performer I was, I was a performing clown for 10 years, that means I was here for five tours. Hi, I'm Peggy Williams, and I work for Feld Entertainment, specifically the Ringling Brothers Barnum & Bailey brand. My very first performance ever in Philadelphia was right here in the Spectrum. Children of all ages! I always liked coming here because I knew that the audience was going to really watch what I did. It's very intimate, even for a sports arena, it's very close up. You can actually make eye contact with people in the audience. And in every section of this building, I, I remember picking out a, a, a child in that section and, and a lady in that section and someone down at the other section. It makes me feel great to think that people in Philadelphia think of the Spectrum and the circus together. I'll miss this building. Just a lot of good memories here. SUV season is here.
Ladies and gentlemen, the Gator with the Heater, the boss with the big hot sauce, Jerry Blavitt, at the Spectrum in Philadelphia. And here is the man. This town is a lonely town. The Spectrum was one of a kind. I mean, I was lucky enough to do two of the greatest rock and roll shows ever at the Spectrum. They were produced by Larry Maggot. And we had Chuck Berry, and we had Bo Diddley, and we had Jackie Wilson, and we had the Shirelles, we had the Dobells, we had Hank Fallon and the Midnighters. Now imagine doing a show with 18,000 people. I mean, it was outrageous. This town. When Sinatra came to the Spectrum, it was the ultimate event, okay? Frank, Sammy, and Liza. Like this town. When Frank came out, forget it. Bedlam, the whole place went crazy. You, town. It's what Philadelphia was about. Philadelphia is a city of neighborhoods, and the neighborhoods came to the spectrum for any event, for shows, for sports, for anything. And it's a part of our history that makes this city a great city, a city of neighborhoods that catered with the Spectrum. Bye-bye, Spectrum in Philadelphia. Now this is the 12th and final round. This is where it will all be decided, I would think. Uh, it was exciting. Philadelphia was a, a terrific boxing town. Uh, both fighters can't hit it after the bell. And this you know, New York got the Mecca, Madison Square Garden. Philadelphia had they Mecca. Had they Madison Square Garden with the name of Spectrum. If you weren't there, you missed it. He's hanging on. Well, in the beginning, since the first real event was Joe Frazier against Tony Doyle, we didn't know what to expect. I made more money than the promoter did because, because that time I was selling the tickets, you know? Like I uh, work at uh, Cross Brothers, uh, and the guys keep saying, oh man, you you don't be no champion. I said, usually, come on, buy these tickets. Oh yeah, there, there was a buzz. People wanted to see what it was like inside, check the sight lines, check the concession stands, you know, check it out, and uh, check wh whether there are enough men's rooms and that kind of thing. You know, the questions you get with a new arena, and they were all answered uh, pretty well. I didn't come from the South uh, to get my butt rubbed. I came here to be a champion, and I intend to be that champion when I left. My name is Russell Peltz. I'm president of Peltz Boxing Promotions. Been promoting fights now for 40 years, mostly in and around the Philadelphia area. People considered it the big time doing something at the Spectrum. The Spectrum was only at the time less than six years old. And I said, listen, the Spectrum has the Sixers, the Spectrum has the Flyers, they have the concerts. They don't need us. They're losing money on boxing. Unless you guys can agree to start fighting each other, which is the way Philadelphia's great fistic history always was, the local matchups, we're going to be out of business, we're going to be back to the arena, and the, the money is going to be cut in half. And it worked like that. Matt Franklin became Matthew Saad Muhammad and, and uh, had a colorful history. Uh, you know, people uh, admired how far he'd come from humble beginnings. Uh, uh, he had a tough childhood. Boxing Federation Light Heavyweight Championship. Saad Muhammad is also one of my personal favorites. And uh, about a year ago, we ran a section in the Ring Magazine where we asked a variety of writers to write about the best fight they've ever seen. And the one I wrote about was his first fight at the Spectrum with Marvin Johnson. Rock'em Sock'em Robots for 11 rounds, and then Saad Muhammad knocked him out in the, in the 12th round. 
It was a Hollywood ending to an incredible fight. That's the greatest fight I ever saw. The fights that I remember the most were uh, Benny Briscoe fights. He had uh, two great fights there with uh, Cyclone Hart. Cyclone packed a punch, and people wanted to see if Benny could absorb the kind of power that, that Hart, you know, brought to the ring with him. Two North Philadelphia neighbors who could really punch, Briscoe the veteran, Hart the up-and-comer, it was a 10-round draw. It was voted the second best fight in the world in 1975 behind the Thriller in Manila. The Philadelphia fans uh, in those days were very knowledgeable, very vocal, but you get 10,000 people in there and it was rocking. Oh, it was a, it was a great time. I, I, I enjoyed going to those fights. Sometimes you got splattered with blood if you sat close enough, and uh, uh, but you... You saw enough memorable, great fights. When they started putting the fights on Prism, the crowd started to go down. And also, when casino gambling came to Atlantic City, that's where the money was for boxing. And the combination of those two things killed the program. I'm glad that I had a chance to uh, not only uh, leave some DNA uh, at that place, but also had a chance to experience it. I'd like to remember the spectrum as talented fighters fighting each other, you know, for neighborhood supremacy, like the big five of boxing. And that's the history of Philadelphia. It will never die, maybe forgotten, but not die. Bye bye, spectrum. <laughs> Hi, I'm Lauren Hart. My dad's name was Gene Hart, the Hall of Fame announcer for the Philadelphia Flyers. That's one thing that the Flyers have had that so many teams have failed to have, and that is tradition. This was a place of great excitement for us, great mystery and uh, discovery, because we, as little kids, we kind of understood what our father did, and we kind of understood the game, but, but not really. It was magic. It was magic for us. It was a fun house, for sure. Played into the corner of Kendrick Chuck Stick. DuPont behind the net, far side past the line's break. I realized who my father was, <laughs> little by little. But I, I remember when I got it, and there was Dad walking through the concourse, and it was like the seas were parting. And everyone was like, Gene Hart, Gene Hart. And I looked at all these faces and I looked at the fans and the way that he looked at the way that he looked at them and the way they looked back at him and I thought, God, this is something incredible. This is really very, very special. It absolutely is an incredible experience for me to be part of the Flyers legacy and the Kate Smith legacy. It really is sort of surreal and it's not anything that I ever could have anticipated. It was my whole life. It was our whole life, the history of, of the Hart family. And so if it was that way for us, it was that way for 17,000 odd number uh, fans that were here every night for those, for those hockey games and everything else. There will never be anything like it again. There will be nothing like what happened here in this building. Let's play.
to arena popular shows, this set the tenor for the rest of the country. It's been a significant part of a lot of people's lives. I hear it all the time, especially now that it's getting closer to uh, being uh, taken down. It's just uh, hard, to, hard to really explain what's, what, what it's going to feel or what the void is going to feel like afterwards. It, uh, you can't help but uh, feel the significance and feel the honor of, of, uh, of being able to uh, help this, this place uh, last this long. It, it really, that it lasted 41 years in today's, in today's world pretty significant, pretty remarkable, o only because there were, there were people that cared about this place. The spectrum probably was one of the greatest achievements of my life. I was young enough not to know better <laughs> and to take a risk that probably I would not have taken if I were older. I just thought it would be great for the city and, you know, never looked at all the ramifications and all of the downside. I just looked at what I thought would be the upside. We were under tremendous financial pressures with the flyers, particularly, and when the roof theoretically blew off, when the tarpaulin came off, and we had to play our last eight games on the road, and we had to refund uh, those eight home games to our fans, and we didn't really have the money. I mean, all of those things. It was a very difficult time, uh, but we got through it. During our first season, we had a weekend where we played two of the original six teams. We played them, we played them well, we, uh, we had a great weekend, we had sellouts, and uh, I said, we're gonna make it, we're gonna make it. What people in our business have to understand is that fans, as a group, are extremely intelligent, and you have to treat them that way. The whole reason for a building is the fans, and we have the greatest fans in the world in Philadelphia. People on the ice, the police against Shepard, the police controls the DuPont. DuPont throws it and scores! The thrill of winning the cup in our seventh year against a powerhouse like Boston with Bobby Orr and Phil Esposito and Ken Hodge and those guys, nothing compares to that. <laughs> Nobody was sitting. We were all standing, you know, pouring champagne on one another. We had the cup and, you know, drinking out of the cup. Nobody was sitting anywhere. <laughs> to me, it was, without a question, uh, the number one event for me. The Russian game in 76. This is incredible. The Soviet Army team is going back to the, the locker room. They are leaving. They are walking out. And I said, well, just tell them we're not going to pay them. They huddled for a few minutes, and they came back in. And they said, OK, we'll play. <laughs> it was the only time during the era of the Broad Street Bullies that we were loved in Canada. The Sixers, they had great years and great players, you know, Julius Irving, Moses Malone, now all these terrific players played in that building, you know, won a championship there. It was a great era for the Sixers. Our goal was to say, hey, we're Philadelphia, but we're every bit as good as New York, and we're going to have every 
bit of the events that they have, and we're going to even do it better. And we did. We had everybody, you know, Presley, Sinatra, uh, Billy Joel was a favorite of mine. I gave him a flyer jersey while he was telling me he was an Islander fan. The building gave us the opportunity to have all the great artists and all the great events that we had. And if it hadn't been built, you wonder, you know, what would have happened here. Once in a while, I do think about it, and I think about how great it's been for the city. But I also think about how great it's been for me, with the pleasure I've gotten and the great life that I've lived and uh, the success I've had with it. So, you know, it's been very good to me, let's put it that way. And I'm just proud that it's been a great asset for the city. It's, uh, it's been a wonderful thing. You gotta understand the Fluffy Basketball goes from the arena at 45th and Market to Convention Hall, okay, now to phew, the Spectrum. The fans, the public, the media had a buzz and an excitement about coming into this modern, state-of-the-art, beautiful arena in South Philadelphia. In the mid-60s, uh, it was obvious that uh, this town and the franchise was ready for uh, a sparkling new building, and that's what we got. And it was fun, it was fun coming into the new place. Now when Wilt Chamberlain, Luke Jackson, Hal Greer, Wally Jones, Chad Walker, Billy Cunningham, and all those guys go in, it's like, this is basketball heaven. With today's NBA, these guys would have been rock stars. We're talking Wilt Chamberlain. Will Chamberlain, who has not a couple of records in the record book, but pages in the record book. I mean, you were going to uh, the big house, which the Spectrum was at that point. And now they were coming in and looking around and saying, man, this is beautiful. I wanted to be first in the layup line to make the first layup uh, in, the, uh, in the Spectrum. So I jumped ahead of a few guys. And uh, I was nervous, too. <laughs> The intimacy of the place always appealed to me. The crowd was right on top of you all the time. You could feel their breath collectively. You could always smell the popcorn. You could smell the hot dogs because everything was so close. They weren't worried about um, amenities. They weren't worried about uh, club boxes. When opponents came into the building, the fans would pounce on them like meat, and they would freak them out with their noise. When you got it going, like late game, big game, Celtics, Chicago Bulls, uh, the fan support in that building was unparalleled. They came to see the game. The game was primary. You know, players, uh, they feed off emotion, and that building housed a lot of it. You know, it sends a chill up your spine. Uh, nobody did it quite like him. He absolutely was one of a kind in his, in his ways, in his inflections. You know, he was an innovator. He was a born entertainer. Zinc was a rare commodity and somebody who I miss very much. That locker room was so small. In the locker room, and even the dinner was larger than this. If you turn your head to do the interview, you might kiss the guy in the ass right next to you. you know, by today's standards, this is, you know, just a cubicle. I mean, I can't remember how many times I kissed Moses' ass. Somebody asked me a question, I turned too quickly. I kissed Moses' cheek, hit me in the jaw. You know, I think there are some advantages to that. There's some intimacy that uh, is gained by that. Favorite memory? Uh, I think they're too numerous to, to come up with a favorite. Irving. The 
best dunk in my memory. All the highlights, all the memories of Dr. Irvin rocked the cradle dunk. You know, things like that. It's uh, you know, sad that it's got to go. Rock the baby to sleep over Michael Cooper. This crowd in the spectrum went absolutely wild. Yes, he's got it. He, here he comes. Ray rocked the baby to sleep and slam dunk. Daryl Dawkins breaking the backboard. And Doug Collins to Daryl Dawkins. It's about to being famous for breaking a backboard. He broke a few around the league in those days. Earl Curitan hits a hook shot over Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, the master of the skyhook. And that is, without question, the loudest I ever heard that building. There's always going to be mixed emotions about it, but most of the memories will be special. Uh, it'll always be special because I played my first pro game there. That place, uh, you know, it obviously is a great, great legacy. You know, I know you can't live in the past, but to me, uh, memories are a part of life, uh, so I'll be, uh, it'll be a little sad for me when it goes down. It is a major piece of the sports fabric in our town. It's a major piece of my heart, and I'm, I'm really going to miss it. Being a part of the last college basketball game was uh, it was such a thrill. There was there was a magic in, in the air. There there was there was uh, there was heat there. It was so hot in that building. You just knew something special was going to happen that night. And this was a huge game for us. So with the team, we kept saying to them, guys, this is an incredible night. But we'll talk about it afterwards. Let's concentrate on Pitt. But I think they all knew and they all felt during that game, the way that crowd was, as hot as that building was, as loud as that building, they knew they were a part of history. And at the end, in the locker room, we explained to them all the great games that had been in there, all the history in this building, and that they, how fortunate they were to, for the rest of their lives, say, I played the last game in college basketball in that building. And this will do it. Villanova in the final college basketball game at the 32-year-old Spectrum in Philadelphia is going to upset number three, Pitt. And Jay Wright, a Philadelphia native, will close out the Spectrum with a win. All I knew is that Dr. J played there, and uh, he was probably my most favorite basketball player growing up. Although it wasn't one of the Philadelphia teams, it was so good that that game was played in a basketball city, in a city that not just likes basketball, but loves basketball, that has a soul for basketball. That's probably what makes Philadelphia such a special college basketball town. They do have that appreciation for the brilliance of the game. Well, it's 1992. And I get a phone call, and a buddy of mine says he's got a couple of tickets to the regional final. That Saturday night was going to be my wife's birthday. I immediately get on the phone and call my best buddy, Fred Perry, and I say, hey, Freddie, listen, whatever you're doing, stop. We're going to the regional final, and it's Duke, Kentucky. I said, well, uh, I, my wife and I were going to go to the saloon for dinner. We're going to take her out. I said, have your wife take the ticket. I said, Fred, maybe you didn't hear me. I said, I scored two tickets to the regional final. It's Duke, it's Kentucky, it's Krzyzewski and Patino. So I thought to myself, what's it going to be? The best college game ever played? What am I going to miss? I just remember walking out of there with a chill, and I couldn't wait to pick up the phone and tell my best friend that he just took a pass on a moment in history. He couldn't wait to say, you just missed the greatest college basketball game ever. And it just so happened to be right in our backyard. That Kentucky team, Patino had the world convinced, had no talent. Of course it had. 
lots of talent. It's a team that won 29 games, a team that uh, won the SEC championship, and a team that basically came out of nowhere to be a number two seed in the East. Kentucky was a really tough team to play that year. They were run and gun, and they just pressed you and tried to outscore you, so I was a little scared to play them, to tell you the truth, because they're a hard team to match up with. This crowd at Fever Pitch for the regional championship. It was a game of run. Thomas Hill. Yes! Duke had a lead. Pelfrey to Feldhaus. Got it! Came back, they took a brief lead, then Duke went back and led. It was almost frenetic, where the lead was changing almost every second. Seven seconds left. Hurley out one-on-one. -on -one. Hurley down the right side. Pull up jumper is up. It will not go down. For me, I'm churning up inside because I know that we're the favorite and Kentucky's playing great. And I think going into the overtime, they have the advantage. 18,000 on hand. Breathless right now. The Spectrum in Philadelphia. They hit a huge shot. We hit a huge shot. Grant Hill, Hurley again. We're tied. Overtime is like every possession. He knew somebody was going to score. Belfry, face Hill in, gets another one. Leitner. Oh, my goodness. Mashburn. Foul. Oh, he'll shoot one. 7.8 seconds remaining. Woods. Yes. When it banked in, I had a football and I just threw it down. I was angry that, you know, we were going to lose on a bank shot. Time out, Duke. Sean Woods has put the Kentucky Wildcats up by one at 103-102 with 2.1 seconds left. And they were kind of a little bit dazed. The whole season is flashing before your eyes. You know, we're only a couple of seconds left, and it doesn't look like we're going to be able to win the basketball game. Now Mike krzyzewski has got to draw something up. I looked in their eyes, and I said, we're going to win. He's like emphatically saying that we're going to win this game. We kind of look up at the clock and want to say, Coach, do you, do you see the situation we're in? Are you sure about this? We're like a fighter who was saved by the bell. Will the dream die here for Duke? It wasn't total desperation. We had two seconds, and it was a play that we practiced. Well, they've got to go full court in 2.1 seconds. They came out of the timeout, and they walked out. Grant Hill went inbound. And I'm looking, and nobody's guarding him. Kentucky opted not to guard the pass, but to surround Leitner with Darren Feldhouse and John Pelfrey. And the next thing I know, the referee's handing him the ball. And I go, my god, you know, what, what's going on here? Do they throw it the left of the floor. All you saw was a blur of activity. Leitner catches, comes down, dribbles. Very calmly, he made a fake to get the defender off him. He spins, he turns. Shoots! Scores! Just before the buzzer. Nothing but now. Christian Leitner has hit the bucket at the buzzer! And I'm thinking to myself, I just saw the greatest shot in college basketball history. The Blue Devils win it! 104 to 103! Everyone is like, ah. what a finish! What a finish! I still remember Sean Woods and Richie Farmer just lying on the floor in disbelief. You can see the agony on his face. There was supreme ecstasy and supreme song. They put it all on the line here tonight. I don't know what happened in that arena that day to allow me to have a perfect game, to not miss any shots. He was 10 for 10 for the night. Man, it was just magical. And Christian Leitner hit the biggest shot maybe of his career. Perfect player had the perfect night and finished off by making the perfect shot. Puts it up. Yes! That moment was as good as it can get. This was a shot heard around the world. It was a shot heard around the world, and it took place in Philadelphia. That's what arenas do. They produce drama, and uh, the Spectrum produced a lot of it. We had a lot of memorable moments here. I'm Gloria Ramfer. I've been working here at the Spectrum about 40 years. My second home. My second home. This is like a home to, I think, a lot of employees here. 
Everybody knew everybody. It was a great family. It was family oriented from the get go. Yeah, we had a lot of uniforms. The first ones were the hot pants. And believe it or not, I used to call them a circus outfit because it was the same color when the circus used to come in. People thought we worked for the circus because we looked like the circus. <laughs> Though the colors were the spectrum colors. What are you going to remember most about the spectrum? Well, me arguing people when the Flyers were going to win the cup. Kept telling everybody they were going to win. They were all telling me I was crazy. But uh, that was a memorable moment. It's like part of your life is going out, like a piece of you is going with it. And I think I'm not the only one that feels this way. There's a lot of people here that feel the same way. Because it's like a part of your family died. And that's what's going to happen. For the... Spectrum was the venue, the venue in Philadelphia for the acts that broke through, and Philly and I was one of those acts. Bruce was one of those acts. Uh, numerous other people were acts that came through Philly and, and broke out of here and broke worldwide out of here. The Spectrum fitted perfectly. It was perfect, and you could see Almost everybody in the room, from where you were on the stage, they, you felt like they could see you. The sound was manageable. It wasn't out of control. It wasn't too big. It wasn't, you know, a monster venue. It was Philadelphia-sized, um, like the package of cream cheese, you know, Philadelphia cream cheese. God bless the Grateful Dead. It was one of the first arenas that we ever played. You know, when we first went on an arena tour, this was really huge for us so it was like um, you know getting your um, getting your feet wet for the first time spectrum we loved you we played you hard and now you're on your way to a better place bye bye this feels right this is our size room this is what we're ready to do and maybe we can we can keep doing this for a while. Who knew? Nobody knew how long it was going to last. The Spectrum made it all possible for these kinds of things to happen. And we'll never forget that. I will never forget that, ever. It is time to move on. Uh, the building has been just fantastic for us. You know, many great memories. And a lot of personal memories for a lot of us who had our offices here. But cosmetically, the building, you know, is looking pretty good, actually. But the infrastructure is getting worn. The development is really going to be special here. And, you know, this area has grown tremendously. Uh, if you remember years ago, it was just the Spectrum and the Vet. As this area has matured, uh, so will we, and, uh, and build a new project. This place will never be forgotten. If we didn't have this development possibility, we would have found a million excuses to keep the Spectrum open. At its ear-shattering best, it was Thunderdome, a Niagara of noise, waves of shuddering sound roiling to the rafters, the echoes ricocheting off the walls. When a Philadelphia team was playing, you could stand out in the parking lot, and the crowd noise would tell you how the home team was faring. If they were winning, the passion was as raw and bone deep as a January night, an unrelenting, urging surge of support. And if they were losing, 
Ah, well, then it was a mournful wail, so haunting that wolf packs a thousand miles away lifted their muzzles to the heavens and bayed at the moon in sympathetic reply. For three full decades and bits and pieces of two more, the spectrum served its purpose uncommonly well. It was more than just an antiseptic arena. It was one of our civic cathedrals, a signature profile, its lights emitting an inviting glow, tempting, bidding you to come in, suggesting all manner of entertainment. Crooners croon there, Dr. J dunk there, Sinatra in a tux, Doc walking on air, smooth, silk on satin, smooth. The Flyers won Stanley Cups there, won them when the sport was new here. Hockey? What's hockey? They came into their locker room before the deciding game to find this message written on a chalkboard by their coach, the enigmatic Fred Shiro. Win today and we walk together forever. Quite a prophecy. Clarkie and Bernie, the Watson brothers, Moose and Hound, Big Bird and the Hammer. Lunch pale, hard hat athletes, hungry. Hungry and ravenous because the big money hadn't infected their sport yet. The Blade Runners. The spectrum was theirs. They brawled and bashed and splattered its ice with blood. The opponents and their own. And in Philadelphia, blood plays big. And then the hardwood would be placed on top of the ice and the 76ers would take over. Moses and Moe, World B, Jelly Bean, the White Shadow, the Kangaroo Kid, the Boston Strangler. Nothing lasts forever, and now the spectrum is coming down. We are left with three playpens now, and we take them for granted. The single best individual play I ever saw on the spectrum was on a dank rain lash night in March of 1992, Duke versus Kentucky in the regional finals of the NCAA tournament. Christian Leitner took a 75-foot inbounds pass, faked, pivoted, and put up a jump shot that spliced the netting at the gun. As is customary in this profession, we were given 37 seconds to write 500 words. There were a lot of deadlines in the spectrum, a lot of nights when you look beseechingly at all those banners draped from the rafters, pleading desperately for inspiration, asking the building to bail you out one more time. It's only a building, the pragmatist will say, and correctly so. Concrete and steel rods, inanimate. Maybe so, but it is also the repository of memories, memories for which there are no replacements. So then, let us lift a glass and cherish the memories.